My name is Rick Archer, and I'm the creator and host of the interview show Buddha the Gas Pump, which is an online video and podcast um, of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Um, I'm going to moderate tonight's event with Adishanti and Francis Bennett. Um, the theme of the talk tonight will be the embrace of Jesus and Buddha, and I just discovered that my friend Francis, who I've been a dear friend for years, is an artist. He painted that picture there. I didn't know that. <laughs> He's a musician. He, he took ballet for 15 years. He's, as I just said a minute ago, a Renaissance man. Um, so it's beautiful. Learn something new every day. So I want to introduce the, the speakers briefly. Um, Adyashanti is an American-born spiritual teacher devoted to serving the awakening of all beings. His teachings are an open invitation to stop, inquire, and recognize what is true and liberating at the core of all existence. I'll give a little bit longer in, um, introduction to Francis because you're probably less familiar with him than you are with Adya. Um, in 2010, while in the middle of a church service in his monastery in Montreal, and Francis lived in monasteries for uh, the better part of 30 years, Trappist and Benedictine, and um, in, in the US, Canada, and uh, Europe. Anyway, while in the middle of a church service, Francis suddenly experienced what he has come to call a radical perceptual shift in consciousness, in which he discovered the ever-present presence of spacious, pure awareness. He came to see that this awareness is actually the unchanging essence of who he really is and always has been, the supreme self, talked about by many sages and saints from many spiritual traditions down through the ages. He also came to see simultaneously that this vast, infinite sense of presence at the center of his being and at the center of the being of everyone else on the planet is actually not at all separate from the presence of God, which he had been looking for during his many years as a monk and spiritual seeker. <clears throat> Francis is now living a, quote, new incarnation as a spiritual teacher. He offers a blend of the Buddhist traditions he studied. He was an ordained Buddhist monk for two years. Um, the contemplative Christian mystical tradition, which he lived during his many years in monastic life, as well as the Hindu Advaita Vedanta teaching of, Ra of Sri Ramana Maharshi, who has had a profound influence on Francis. So again, the, um, the theme of tonight's talk is the embrace of Jesus and Buddha, and I would like to ask Francis, first he's going to start with a chant, and then he'll give us a synopsis of what is going to be discussed. So the chant that I want to share with you is a chant that I did when I was ordained in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition. Every day was part of our regular chanting we did, and it's called the Namo Tassa, homage to the enlightened one, the worthy one, the fully awakened one. Uh, and then we took refuge every day in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And um, tonight we're talking about Jesus and Buddha, the embrace of Jesus and Buddha, and uh, when we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, we're really taking refuge in our own true nature, not necessarily even the historical Buddha, Gautama, who lived in ancient India, but the Buddha nature within us, our own Christ nature, our own Buddha nature, which I think are really the same thing called by different names. So this little chant that I thought we'd start with, and maybe we'll end with a Christian Gregorian chant just to round it out. So the first one is the Namotasa and the Refuge. So we can chant that. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami Yeah. 
you want to tell us what that means, or should we just stay with the sound of it? It means uh, homage to the worthy one, the awakened one, the fully enlightened one. And then the, the refuge is I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. Mm -hmm. So the Buddha, as I said, is our own true nature, uh, the Buddha nature within all of us. Uh, the Dharma is the teaching of the enlightened ones, all those who have come to understand their true nature. And the Sangha is the community of enlightened ones, which includes all of us. So that's the meaning of that. Now, um, why don't you give us just a synopsis? As you, we may veer off in other directions, and I'll be asking questions, you'll be asking questions, but as you anticipate it, what do you feel like we'll be covering tonight or you would like to cover? Well, I guess the, uh, <clears throat> the desire to, to do this um, came out of my own experience of Buddha and Jesus. Uh, as, as Rick said, this is an icon. I painted icons in the monastery. This is not a very traditional one, of course, because it's <laughs> Buddha and Jesus together. It's based on an icon of St. Peter and Paul embracing. So I based the kind of positions of the figures in the icon on that, but I made it Jesus and Buddha. And the reason I did that was because uh, they've both been really archetypes and symbols of awakening in my own life. And my sense uh, over time as I've reflected on it and reflected on my own life journey is that the Buddha for me in many ways represents the transcendent awakening, the, the awakening up and out of the merely human kind of identity that we usually primarily identify with. So the Buddha represents that transcendent movement up and out of and then the Christ represents the imminent movement back down and into. So the Buddha transcends samsara, the kind of cycle of birth and death in this phenomenal world. And then the Christ actually enters back into samsara with the compassionate heart of mercy and acting in the world in altruistic, compassionate ways. So for me, both the Buddha and the Christ represent the full circle of awakening that has a transcendent movement and an imminent movement. So for me, both of them were really, really central figures in my life, and I feel a great love and appreciation for both of them. They're both major teachers for me. Maybe yeah. you have something to say about that. Um, well, I think sort of parallel, um, one of the things that me and um, Francis share is from our different, at least sort of, early religious orientations. Um, you know, that part of Francis, even when he was in the monastery, was also doing some very intensive and serious Buddhist meditation practice with, with, with a number of, of really fantastic Buddhist teachers. And when I was in Buddhist, Buddhism, when I was a Zen student, I, um, curiously enough, found myself at some point in their naturally sort of reaching out into the Christian mystics because they were providing something or I found something there that I couldn't I couldn't find in a way that really was obvious or resonated for me um, in 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 Zen and so for me it was really the discovery of sort of the spiritual heart um, of course it is in Zen but it's in a, it's in a sort of a different form and so, in, and, and then it just sort of snowballed from there, as, as I've often said, that strangely enough, I actually came to understand a lot of the Buddhist teachings through, on, through the study of some of the Christian mystics, actually. Um, and so often it goes, it's the other way around. You know, people are involved in the Western religion, that they reach out to the East for something. And I was in an Eastern religion and reaching out to the West to sort of fill in a sort of what was for me a, a gap. And so we've both had this, we both, you know, uh, Francis, of course, being a, being a Christian monk for about a part of 30 years and me and my Zen practice, and we both reached out into each other's traditions um, for, our own, for our own reasons. But I think that's kind of also where we've, where we've, um, uh, we, we really meet, we really meet. It's part of what I think formed our, informed our friendship, which is that we both have such a profound love of both of these traditions that, you know, that we both participated in with some 
with some depth. And as over the years we've known each other, we've, we've talked about, I think what you'll probably get into, Rick, too, also, is that, um, is how I think uh, they, that they do sort of symbolize in, a, in a, almost a mythological sense um, kind of two different spiritual movements. And I think you said it very, very well, sort of the, the traditional transcendent movement of the, that Buddhism as a whole, you know, really is a, even the, the image of the Buddha in a seated meditation posture is telling us something central about that tradition. And then, of course, um, in the Christian tradition, I also think of it as sort of the down and in transition uh, tradition, even though it's sometimes I find people find that a little bit confusing because a lot of Christian theology is very up and out, very, very, very transcendent, um, which is actually an awful lot of Greek philosophy. <laughs> it it is. actually informed that, whereas... Jesus and his life and his teaching, the actual story itself, I think is a very, very embodied form of spirituality, a, a way to embrace the, sor the sorrows of the world. It's almost like you overcome them by fully embracing them, fully diving in. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think these, these two traditions sort of hold places for each of us individually that are very, very close and very dear. And I think they also hold a sort of almost mythologically they 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 hold different different places in the greater story story of spirituality. I think. Yeah. You kind of led into a question that I was thinking uh, of, which I don't have either a Christian or a Buddhist background. I have more of a I guess you'd say a Hindu one, Shankaracharya tradition. Mm -hmm. But um, as from my uninformed perspective. There seems, to, you know, Buddhism seems to be about getting out of suffering once and for all, and Christianity seems to talk about suffering a lot. And some of the great Christian saints were suffered terribly, and and didn't even reveal that they were suffering, and, and actually almost seemed to say, "Bring it on, give me more," because it's, this somehow purifies me or helps me or something. So, would that relate to the up and out versus down and in thing that you were talking about? Uh, or, or not? Well, like Adya just said, I, my sense is that actually both traditions have both the up and out and the down and in. Mm -hmm. Both have a transcendent um, kind of aspect or dimension to their path, and both have an imminent kind of more embodied dimension. But in my mind and heart, uh, the Buddha is more of an archetype of transcendence for me personally, and the Christ is more of an archetype of the imminent. Um, you know, it's interesting, though, because um, I, I think the truth in general, truth with a capital T, is a subtle, nuanced reality. It's a living reality. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something that has a kind of black and white flavor to it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, often if you state, state something as a truth, uh, you can see the kind of opposite side of that coin in some way. The whole truth has various dimensions to it, almost like different facets of a diamond, you know, that they make up the whole diamond. And for me, um, this whole theme of Jesus and Buddha, the embrace of Jesus and Buddha, is essentially pointing to that reality, uh, that truth about truth, that truth is uh, not just a one-sided thing. It's not... Um, an either-or kind of proposition. It's always both and. It's always kind of including something that seems paradoxically almost the opposite. Mm -hmm. And the more my own clarity and awakening unfolds, the more I see that over and over again. I just see that that the truth is not one-dimensional. You know, it's three-dimensional at least, and maybe four or five-dimensional. I don't know. Um, so for me, the the whole image of Jesus and Buddha kind of are symbols of that. Um, you know, I used to be, I mean, I was raised an Irish Catholic. I entered a monastic life at a very young age. And uh, if you had come across me in my early 20s, uh, I, I would have uh, seemed very clear about what I believed and what I thought. You know, I thought I pretty much had it figured out by the time I was, you know, 23, 24. I'd gone to college, I had a degree in philosophy, I'd studied theology, I'd gone through my religious formation, I thought I had it all 
kind of figured out. But the more, the deeper I went into this exploration of truth, the more I realized that uh, I could say more about what I didn't know than what I knew. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that this uh, topic of Jesus and Buddha, in a way, it's just a symbol. It's like a, a mythic symbol, almost, you could say, of our own journey that I think does involve a transcendent movement and a more embodied movement. Mm -hmm. So that's where I thought it might be valuable to kind of reflect on that. And what does that look like in our lives, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just think about the historical Buddha and Jesus, but, you know, how have we experienced that in our lives, this movement of transcendence and this movement of mm -hmm. imminence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I'll, that these two, these two sort of archetypes, because that's how I kind of see them in a way. They're these these two archetypes that they're, you know, as are all archetypes really are pointing to sort of lived realities within us, and you know we all I think resonate with different things <coughs> at different points in our journey. What we resonate actually tells us very much about where we are at. In our own, in our own unfolding, in our own, in our own, our own journey, and um, I think one of the reasons we like this sort of subject, though, is because is because both of these traditions, like like where where one is where one is a little weaker, the other is a little stronger, and where the other is a little bit weaker, then another one's you know really strong, even to the point of. Um, you know, the Buddhist Buddhist teachings can read a bit almost like a. Um, like a doctor's prescription, if you know what I mean. Um, they're, they're very, very precise, very, very, very well thought out, very, very repetitive. You know, there's this whole way that it's all sort of laid out, which is actually quite, quite beautiful in its own right, in its, in its sense. But the thing that I've liked also about the, what I always just call the Jesus story is because stories themselves I think, can live in us in ways that um, just straight doctrine cannot. You know, it's in, you, we, we, everybody's heard the story of Jesus or they've heard the story of Buddha. You know, these are just so well-known well sort of iconic images. And, um, and yet I think the, it's, it's, it's a story can convey things that a straight teaching cannot convey. You know, it just, it can bring things along, and which I think is one of the things that in our modern day also we've kind of forgotten that. That, you know, we, we, we think, oh, a myth is, just means something that's not true. Like equating, if somebody just tells you a lie, they're telling you a myth, but they're actually not. A, a myth is sort of an encoded form of, of truth. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a reason why, say, either the Jesus story or the or the Buddhist story, but they resonate with people, right? They touch something. That's what these sort of archetypal images um, images do. And um, like I said, I think they are corrective almost. You know, like in, in Buddhism, you can get so much about, you know, the, the, the ending of suffering that you can actually start to make this mistake, I think with most people do, which is, Spirituality is about the elimination of all forms of suffering. And that's just, number one, it's just ridiculous. Um, but that's a, that's a very prevalent, you know, idea. Speaking as someone who's just recovering from a nasty flu. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, and yet we all have that instinct to certainly at the very least minimize the unnecessary suffering. I think that's really what Buddha is talking about, that there is this immensity of human suffering that is actually optional. I think Jesus' story confronts us with, and there is also suffering that is not optional. It's that inevitable. Really. Inevitable, and if you're going to jump in and you are going to play this game, you can't really play it well and play it, be in it in order to never suffer. Because to do that sometimes then we have to start closing either our minds down or our hearts down or we got to start suppressing a little bit or, you know, and then you have the, the, the balancing image of, like of a, of a Jesus that just sort of, you know, fearlessly is just throwing himself into situations where he will suffer. 
You know what I mean? There, there's, there's no attempt not to suffer. In fact, he doesn't even really talk about, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven is a place where you'll never, ever, ever, ever have anything remotely like a bad day again. Um, <laughs> Probably that day on the cross is, was one of those times that wasn't yeah, yeah, right. you know, yeah. wasn't five star. No, it certainly, it certainly. I've often thought, I wonder if anybody. In fact, I've told rooms, I've questioned room, rooms of people. This I've put this question out there: if you could actually have whatever your version of total liberation is, except your life would, ha would look very much like Jesus' life looked. Like, okay, how many people would sign up for that? Like, and, and I think it's, it, it, it's, 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 it is kind of, you know, there's something that's humorous about it, but there's also something that, like, can get us to kind of reflect and go, like, what is my relationship to this whole thing? You know, mm. is, is that the end? Is that the end all and be all? Is that the, is that really what this is? simply about or is there something else and of course you know Jesus, i can see jesus and the buddha by the way both whispering in someone's ear like it's also about love or i can hear the buddha saying don't forget it's about compassion it's not only about you never having a bad day you know it's about what does it mean to 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 what is a kind, kind of realization that gives one the, the, the freedom and the confidence and the courage to throw themselves into life rather than trying to look for an escape hatch from life? Because there's two different, those are two different kinds of freedom. Yeah. You know, there's two different qualities, I think, of freedom. Francis was talking a minute ago about. Um that we are sort of, what did you use the word, multidimensional or multifaceted, that paradoxical truths at different levels of reality can be lived simultaneously. And um, in light of, my, my former teacher was once being interviewed on the BBC alongside the Abbot of Downside, Christ oh. Christian Abbot. Basil Hume? I don't know who, what he his was name the Abbot was. Of Downside. Well, this is back in the 60s. And um, he, my teacher proclaimed, Christ never suffered. And the abbot of downside didn't like the sound of that. But what he meant was that, um, you know, obviously his body went through something horrific. But he said if he was really Christ, if he was really established in the bliss of the self and the universal spirit, whatever we want to call it, then it's possible to be so established in that way that despite what's happening to the body, you're untouched by it. It's being felt on some level, but simultaneously on some other level, somehow one is not that universal consciousness is not touched. Is there anything in the ex ex your personal experience, either or both of you, that um, like you, when you just had the flu, was there some dimension that didn't have the flu? Yeah, sure there is. And um, <laughs> I say that I say that casually <clears throat> because it's just it's just sort of the background of my life. So I'm not, I'm not going through like having the flu and going, okay, now let me see if there's a part of me that's not. We wouldn't have to think about it. I, you know, no, yeah, I don't, it, no, it's, it's, so it's, it's very, very sort of, you know, not reflective. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not, I'm not sort of reflecting all, on all of it. You know, if I do reflect on it, there's sure, there's always something that's, that's, um, that's okay. You know, that's, that's not affected. But um, I'm always, uh, personally, I always hesitate. I always like, oh, okay, hmm. Am I ready to, would I re be ready to sign on to the statement that your teacher made? I'm not so sure that I would. Yeah. Yeah. I well, think a lot of it is our degrees. You know, if, if, if you take the most enlightened guy or woman's in the world and, you know, you, you tie, tie, tie this hand and pull it in a direction and tie this one and have two cars move in the opposite directions, pulling them apart. I don't know that the person's going to be sitting there in a state of nervicalpa samadhi while their body's being torn to pieces and they're in a state where they're very much untouched. So I think these things can be, have a truth. They're pointing to a truth of that there is something that's always, always okay. Yeah. Um, and yet, um, 
I think Jesus would have definitely failed the test that your teacher gave him. Because even contemplating what he was going to go through was enough to, to make bring him, him sweat to, drops of blood. To drops of blood and be in tears and be begging his disciples for their support. Mm. You know, can you, can you stay with me? Can you be with me? I'm, I'm just about to go through, you know, this terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Um, so I think sometimes when I hear phrases, you know, that that's a good example one, I always try to go, okay, what are they pointing towards? What's the point that's being tried to be made? And is it necessary to take this as, a, as completely and absolutely literal? As much as human beings would love to take it as completely and absolutely literally because human beings are sort of hooked up to not want to suffer. Yeah. You know? Well, for instance, when Ramana was dying of cancer and screaming in pain, you know, his disciples were expressing their concern. And he, I don't remember verbatim what he said, but it was basically like, don't worry, I'm okay in here. You know, yeah. their, their external perception of him and what they imagined they would be experiencing if right. they were going through what he was going through were quite different than his subjective experience. Yeah, it, it reminds me of, of what um, Shun, Shunryu Suzuki went when he was dying of cancer, Zen master, started San Francisco mm -hmm. Zen Center, and at one point when his cancer also, as often is the case, became very, very, very painful for him. And, you know, his students could see him struggling, you know, although he tried to be, function right up to the very end. Um, but he told them, I think, something that corresponds to what you said, Rick. And he says, if when you see me suffer, don't worry about me because it's only Buddha suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought, oh, you know, it's, that was a really beautiful, like a kind of choice of words because it wasn't denying what he was experiencing, then it was very powerful, but it, ought, that, that it wasn't causing him to, to, to fracture. To deny it to, or to, to, shut to, down. To, to deny or to shut, right, or to shut down or to, you know, he, he could still be very much in touch with, oh, yeah, this is, okay, this is Buddha suffering. I, I just recently had an interesting experience um, I lost my brother. My brother died. We're twins. And uh, he's the last, he was the last family of, of my, of, you know, person in my immediate family. So that was a big deal for me, you know. I never thought my brother would die in his 50s, you know. It just didn't, wasn't in my plan, my life plan. Uh, but it happened. And I remember uh, talking to you the day he died and saying to Adya, you know, it's funny, on one level, I am fine with this. He's died, and I accept that, and that's the way it is, and my heart is completely broken. And both are true, mm -hmm. you know? I think, again, the human intellect, the human mind, we want it to be either or, don't we? We want it to be either you're completely untouched or you're absolutely overwhelmed with suffering. And I think what it is is that when we awaken, when we really come to understand who we really are on the deepest level, you know, who we are on the level of the Christ, who we are on the level of the Buddha, we're suddenly in a vast, spacious place that's infinitely large. Mm -hmm. And it's big enough to hold whatever comes. You know, but it's absolutely and unconditionally open. Mm -hmm. So whatever comes is embraced. Whatever comes is completely accepted unconditionally. And that, in the human experience, in case you hadn't noticed, includes pain, sorrow, heartbreak, tragedy, you know, disease, death, all those things. And I think we want it to be either or. We want, if you're awakened, that's not going to touch you at all. You're going to just be this stoical kind of person that's going to rise above it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's what this whole evening is really reflecting on, is that, you know, we need the transcendence. We need to find that place of spaciousness. But we also need to be open to everything that life puts on our plate. Mm -hmm. 
you know, even when it's difficult. You know, losing my brother uh, was, I think, the most difficult thing I've ever experienced. I, I think it was more difficult than the loss of my parents. Mm -hmm. Because my parents were old, you know. I mean, I lost my parents. My mom, I was, uh, you know, four, 50, 50 when she died. So, and she was 91. So I kind of expected to lose her. I didn't expect my brother to die. Mm -hmm. you know, in his 50s. Mm -hmm. My dad also was in his late 80s, you know. But like you say, on one level, um, there was a place where I was at peace. There was a place where it was all fine, it was all okay. And on another level, my heart was completely broken. Mm -hmm. So I think both are true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly corresponds to my experience. Yeah. I do was <clears throat> you were talking about stories a little while ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um we know that nothing much was written down about Jesus until several I don't know 50 100 couple hundred years after his death. 80. Pardon? Not a couple hundred, but yeah. Yeah, yeah a little quite bit a while, at least stuff. a generation or two. Mm -hmm. And uh maybe I don't know if the same is true of Buddha or not. And then in terms of the mm -hmm. actual scriptures, you know, the canonical texts, um, it's my understanding that there were many, many more than actually made it through all the, all the screen cuts and all the edits and the Council of Nicaea and all that stuff. Um, so we won you wonder, and again, I don't know if there's a corollary to that in Buddhism, but you wonder whether what we know of as Buddhism and, and Christianity, how much resemblance it has to what they were actually teaching. And a little addendum to that question is, you know, if you got Jesus and Buddha together in a, in a room like that, your picture depicts and maybe added, we do you know, <laughs> added Krishna and, uh, yeah. you know, Muhammad and Zoroaster and a few others for good measure, would they all um, concur with one another? Yeah, we're all talking about the same thing. Or, or would there be differences of opinion? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I, my guess is that we, there would be there would be differences. You think? I, I, I've never bought. I've never bought into the idea that. Uh, I mean, we do this because, and it's generally a good thing, you know, that conferences get made so so contemplatives can come together, put their hands around each other, Some have a kumbaya, kumbaya moment, and go, you know, <laughs> you're not as bad as we thought you were, and we're we're much more alike than we are different. And I think that is, that is one of the beautiful things that happen when people of deep inner work get together. There often is this sort of recognition that there are, so, there are more similarities than doctrine often makes it seem like there are. And yet, I think what sometimes gets lost in, in the rush to, that we all have a sort of wonderful unified moment is sometimes we can lose what I think is the beauty of diversity. You know, that, that uh, the Buddha's realization may, may, have, may have had very somewhat different qualities than Jesus has had, may have had a lot of similarities, but there may have been some really important differences. Mm -hmm. Certainly as on the level of personality and the way they lived their life, there were profound differences. I mean, you know, Buddha was basically setting up a spiritual elite. He was interested in monks and nuns and creating this thing, and, and you know, that's kind of what he wanted to do, whereas Jesus was almost just the opposite. Mm -hmm. He was sort of tearing down the walls of, of any kind of elite, mm -hmm. including spiritual, religious, and I think there was a, there's a vision difference. They're, they're, they're seeing something that's that's a little bit may complementary i think definitely um but i think that's one of the that's one of the beauties of the different religions is they they are reflecting different aspects of the same jewel yeah that last bit helped wrap it up because um if spirituality is really about coming to understand what reality is uh and not just about the social or monastic structures or the, the, the sort of the more manifest aspects of the, yeah. uh, of the of a teaching uh, then one would hope that fundamentally 
um, you know, there was a, a concurrence. Like, you know, you could have different maps of North America and you could have a, a topographical map and a road map and an aviation map and a map of all the gas pipelines or something. And they each have their utility and they serve different functions for different people mm -hmm. in different circumstances. But they all actually refer to the same territory. They're just bringing mm -hmm. out different facets or bits of information about that very same well, I territory. I think they're all in the same territory of consciousness. Yeah. They are, they are all discovering the reality, the deeper realities, the deeper potentialities of consciousness. In that sense, I would agree that they're, you know, they're all looking sort of at the same, the same thing. They're all, they're, they're, they're plunging into the, you know, the, the same, the same reality of, of, of consciousness. Um, and yet, um, you know, there are obviously some very, very different orientations. It's hard for me to, to, real, to, to hear um, Jesus, you know, coming and going, well, you know, folks, the, uh, the world is an illusion. It's unreal. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Why get involved? Because what's going to happen is going to happen no matter what you do. And what's, what, what, and what's not going to happen is not going to happen no matter what you do, which we hear from a lot of, you know, other sort of sages, which... That that is a legitimate perspective because that is that is that is one that is a certain dimension of consciousness you can go to, and some people would bump into that and kind of go like, okay, that's it, that's that that is the ultimate state. I don't necessarily think Jesus would come in and go, yes, that is the ultimate state. I think he would have his own little di different take. You know, they yeah. they both may be sitting in California. Having a different take on it, however, that's that much I would certainly grant. Let me just say one quick thing, and then Francis, okay? Quick. There's a quote that I heard you say um, in, years ago in some talk, uh, which I really love, which points to this. Is he's, Jesus said, you know, for the for the birds have their nests and the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man ha has no place to lay his head. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, just refers to what you're saying here, which is that he had ultimately no fixed point of view, no sort of rigid thing, which well, sort of refers to what you were saying about the different dimensions and different levels. You have to sort of embrace them simultaneously and not mm -hmm. fixate in any one or else you end up with sort of a lopsided or fundamentalistic perspective. I'm sorry for no, you, about to, you wanted to say something, so go ahead now, please. Yeah, my sense, I, I mean, I think at different points in my life, uh, I have thought at various times that like Christianity had the the whole truth somehow that you know the whole truth could be found in this one religion that I had embraced and really dedicated myself to and that was where the truth lied you know many people would say the same thing about Buddhism or about Hinduism or about you know Judaism or Islam or whatever I've come to a point in my life where I no longer think any religion has the whole truth I honestly do not I think that uh, when we talk about the maps of consciousness somehow have to agree, we're, we're starting from this presumption that somehow or other these maps of consciousness are complete. My sense is that none of them are complete. Yeah. You know, For myself, I needed Jesus. I really needed Jesus in my life. I needed what he symbolized. I needed that archetype to symbolize my own interior journey mm -hmm. in a certain direction. I also needed Buddha. I needed the embrace of Jesus and Buddha. And I think that part of the beauty of the embrace of Jesus and Buddha is that they're, they're both bringing different things to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, my spiritual journey was completed by embracing what Jesus represented for me and embracing what Buddha represented for me. And they didn't represent the same thing mm -hmm. at all. They represented different aspects of the path of awakening. You know, they, they represented different movements of it, both being perfectly valid, but like you said earlier, I think both kind of needing each other to balance each other out, mm -hmm. which we, you know, you often see that in a married couple, you know, that my mom and dad were like that. I mean, they were married for 64 years. My dad was this very masculine, very kind of, you know, alpha male type guy, very much in control. My mom was a very feminine, very kind of, open, compassionate, loving person, and they got together. And the odd thing to me was at the end of their life, they had beautifully 
balanced each other out. Mm -hmm. At the end of my dad's life, he was very open. He was very receptive. He was a good listener. He would, you know, ask you, how, you know, what are things, how are things going for you? What's going on in your life? And he'd sit there and just listen, kind of seemingly passively. Mm -hmm. And my mom became kind of more of a go-getter, more kind of directive, more, you know, especially with my dad. <laughs> and uh, they kind of took on the polar opposite characteristics that each of them somehow embodied. And their marriage helped them get in touch with that inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, with my mom, with her own kind of what we would traditionally think of as a kind of masculine energy. My dad, a kind of feminine, more mm -hmm. receptive energy. Mm -hmm. So I think that this embrace of Jesus and Buddha is like that. They each bring their own energy. And that doesn't need to be exactly the same at all. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. you sent me some notes that you had been thinking about along these topics, and here's one that kind of relates to this. I think you said um, different masters meet the different needs of each age. There's usually a resurgence or renewal of knowledge when society has become close to truth. And there's a line that's kind of like this in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, "When Dharma is in decay and a Dharma flourishes, oh, right. I take birth age after age." Um, so it would seem that, you know. There's a cycle of loss and revival of knowledge somehow, mm -hmm. and um, but each revival is not necessarily going to be identical because each age is different. Uh, but it's interesting now because we have communications and much clearer historical knowledge than most of these, you know, isolated cultures had one or two thousand years ago, and so we're able to kind of make a stew of all kinds of ingredients mm -hmm. that weren't available in previous ages. I suppose this could be confusing for some people, and maybe some people really need to stick to the straight and narrow of a particular mm -hmm. teaching, but others might find it really uh, enriching, as you did, to um, you know, add various uh, teachings to, their, to the mix. You know, I, um, I was a monk of Gethsemane, which was the monastery of Thomas Merton, a very well-known spiritual writer, who was very much a pioneer in the area of interspirituality and interspiritual dialogue and interreligious dialogue. And the whole time I was at Gethsemane, I was involved in that. There were Tibetan monks, there were Zen monks, there were Hindu monks that came, and we would have what we called intermonastic dialogue. And I think that, um, oh, where was I going with that now? Your multiple teachings and mixing them. Yeah, in, in yeah. Kind of like a bee going from one kind of flower to another. Well, what I found the most valuable, and I, I kind of think Merton was a model in this for me, was that I went very, very deeply into one tradition, as deeply as I could. And then after I was kind of established in that, I noticed, interestingly to me, the parallels I found in different paths. And first of all, it was the parallels. And then eventually going into uh, the, these other various paths, I found um, uh, contrasts as well. But they were, it was all very rich, like both, the, both understanding and discovering the parallels and understanding the contrast, mm -hmm. which, which helped me balance out in a way that I couldn't have done if I had just stayed in one line. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there is a, there is a point there that's a, a point that's a good point, is that I think it's good to take each of these traditions um, kind of on their own terms and take them straight, kind of, you know, and, and really get a sense of what they're about before we add to the mix. Yeah. Um, and make, uh, there's, a, there's a book called Stages of Faith that was often uh, read in uh, some of you, if you come from any kind of seminary or clergy background, you probably read Stages of Faith by Fowler. It's a really popular book. And there's a chapter in there where he talks about Sheilaism. And Sheilaism, he said, there's this woman he met named Sheila and uh, was interviewing her. And she, he said, what, is, what are your spiritual beliefs? And she said, well, I started out a Christian, uh, kind of in the Presbyterian church. Then I became a Baptist. Then I became a Hindu. And then I became a Buddhist. And so I just kind of threw it all in a pot and mixed it up really good. And then I came out with my own religion that I call Sheilaism, <laughs> which is a mixture of all these things. How it's does like, that work for her? Well, on one level, that, okay, that's fine, you know, whatever, if it works for you, you know, God bless you. But uh, on another level, it might be good for us to just take each of these things on their own, 
take what we find good, but don't like just make our own religion, mix mm -hmm. it all up, you know. Mm -hmm. There's that old saying that, you know, it's better to dig one deep well than ten shallow right. wells. But then yeah. somebody said, well, how about using ten different tools to dig one deep well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> That's Rickism. Say, good shot. <laughs> <laughs> Not Sheilaism, Rickism. Yeah. yeah. No, but I think there's this really important thing in that because, I mean, in our own different ways, when we when we had when we did borrow from other traditions, um, I mean, Francis obviously and even, even me, we we really threw ourselves in. You know, I didn't read a couple of books on Christian mysticism. You know, I read a couple of hundred. And did the spiritual, many of the practices that were in those books. Um, you know, and so I think there is, there is, this is something that we all face nowadays, that we all have so much exposure, right, to a million and one teachings. And it is, there is always the danger, it is easy to kind of lose yourself. Lose your, I mean, this is all about discovering something here. And sometimes if it's, you know, if we're too much in too, at the same time, we can we lose connection with what it's, what it's really, really, um, really about. And yet we are in the world that we're in and we have lots of exposure to a lot of things. So I think that, that puts the kind of responsibility back on each of us that, you know, if we're, spirit, if we're serious about these things, there's a time when we're dabbling to see what's there and what resonates. But when we're serious that we, that we really um, if we're going to utilize something that we really do dive into it so, so that we aren't just creating something that fits us almost because you, you can create something very easily that fits you in such a way that you're nice and conveniently unchallenged. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, buy it. You, you've, you've got rid of all the elements that sort of challenge the ego and leave the elements in that make it feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, that, that I think we're all well served that whatever, any teaching we utilize, that we do it with great mm. honesty and, 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 and depth, I think. <laughs> Who was that playwright that wrote The Importance of Being Earnest? Oh, right. Um, Anybody know? Oscar, Oscar Wilde. Wilde. Yeah. And I, th that just came to mind. I was going to actually quote Nisargadatta who, who said it's, earnestness is really important. And then I thought, well, there's a play by that name. Mm -hmm. But um, I, uh, I think that that might be something that would tie some of this together because re regardless of what you do, whether you're kind of sampling a smorgasbord a little bit or totally, you know, have the blinders on, you're totally focused on one, one teaching or one tradition, I think earnestness is the, um, mm -hmm. the key element for success. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think that earnestness is certainly a quality that you see in different ways in both Jesus and Buddha. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and I think the important thing isn't so much, you were talking earlier about the historical Jesus. You know, there's been a whole controversial kind of focus for the last, oh, probably 80 years or more of the historical Jesus. Who was the historical Jesus? And I think really in, in all fairness you could say the same thing about the Buddha, you know. It's, you know, you got a kind of oral tradition. First you've got the teacher that just says certain things and gives a teaching. Then you've got an oral tradition of that that goes on for usually 50 to 100 years or more. And then they write it down. So between the words that came out of the mouth of Jesus or Buddha and the, or, and the written down tradition, there's this passing down of oral stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know in a class that I took in seminary once, we had a thing where somebody started with a statement and we had a, a, a room of a circle of people and they whispered in the person's ear next to them and then they whispered in the next person's ear and we got around and then we got to the end and the person said, okay, what was the statement at the beginning? They said, you know, the roses are red or whatever. And then the last person said, you know, uh, uh, red is, uh, red is, distorted. yeah, red is blue or something, you know, <laughs> it just, it just went around yeah. and kind of lost something in the translation. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in a way, you know, uh, I know that I had a, a, a little dialogue with, um, what's that guy you interviewed him and he, he wrote a book about Jesus being a myth or something. Or, oh, Tim Freak. Ki yeah, Tim, yeah, Timothy Freak. And, and Peter um, Gandhi wrote. Jesus yeah, Man. it's not a new idea. I mean, no. this has been, been, been thrashing around for a hundred years, like I say. 
uh, and now they're basically saying, or no, that Jesus wasn't even a historical person at right. all. Right, and he quoted, I mean, he cited all sorts of um, references from other civilizations, Egyptian mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things, right. and had you know, a couple dozen different points that, mm -hmm. in the Jesus story that are also in those traditional stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, now most historians, most kind of current academic sort of work on this level is saying, no, there was a historical person named Jesus, you know, whether or not our attitudes and thoughts about him and impressions of him are accurate to the historical person is another question. But you could say the same thing about the Buddha, I think. But in a way, at this point, it doesn't really matter. No. I, think, I think what they represent now is more about our own inner journey. It's like you were talking about myth earlier, and Joseph Campbell wrote this this book about myth and, and did a whole study on it. And he talks about the hero journey. And Buddha and Jesus are really... Um, representatives of the hero journey, but we're all called to make the journey. You know, we're all called to embrace uh, the kind of life that Jesus and Buddha embraced. And part of it, as you just said, is to go all in. Yeah. That, you know, it really requires earnestness. It requires a kind of commitment that involves, uh, like Jesus said, you know, giving up everything and coming and following. Mm -hmm. And we don't like to hear that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's that is that's part of the archetype too. As P and and also not only that they were tremendously devoted and committed, um, but I think there's something else about, especially about these two characters, that resonates in the human heart. And I think it's something about. They did something that's very, very unusual to do, very rare, both, and both of them did it in their own ways to me. They, they, um, they, stepped, they definitely stepped off of the path well-trodden. They, they, they kind of stepped out there where, where nobody else was going eventually, and there wasn't a whole lot of signposts, and there wasn't a whole, everything wasn't really well-defined, and not only, you know, did they come to their own spiritual liberation in their own right, but I think there's also something that I've always thought that intuitive resonates for people without them even knowing it or being really conscious of it, is that it's almost like, now there's an actual autonomous human being. There's somebody who's not looking around going, y'all like it? Is it okay if I'm this way? Does it fit into the program? Does it, you know, they're, they're very uh, um, uh, autonomous human beings, which, you know, true, true deep autonomy um, is, is not an easy thing to achieve. Right. And I think both of them are sort of hallmarks of people who did that, and they did what it takes to do that, which, you know, you, you, you can't just be sort of following safely along in whatever herd you might be in, autonomy is usually, um, it's, it's hard won. It's, you, you kind of got to scrape and claw your way to find out what's really, really authentic within, you know, within, within you. What's really real, what's really um, authentic. And I think that's part of what resonates for people too. They, they can feel that's a kind of freedom too. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just an inner, like, I feel really spacious and open and free, as, as wonderful as that is, but it's also a, f a freedom to actually be who they are, come what may. You know, they both had their sort of human missions in life to be who I am, come what may, you know, um, and I think that's also part of the part of both of their characters that are actually very, very similar. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to come back to the map metaphor for a minute. <clears throat> um, you know, we had metaphor? what we might call pardon the what metaphor map metaphor. Oh, math. Map M A P. Yeah. Oh, map. Yeah, map. not math. Um, <laughs> we had what we might call Christian cartographers of consciousness. We had you know um, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and maybe Meister Eckhart who um, I think Teresa wrote The Interior Castle, and uh, she spoke of the seventh dwelling place, which was union of the soul with God. Um, and uh, it seems to me that from, again, an outside perspective on Christianity and Buddhism, 
that the the mystics in Christianity were much fewer and farther between than in Buddhism. Buddhism seemed to more explicitly delve straight into inner experience. And yet, um, in Christianity, it's all about God. It was all this talk of God and, and mm -hmm. experience of God, not just a concept or a belief. Whereas, to, to my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, the Buddha hardly talked at all, if at all, about yeah. God. And God isn't really mentioned in Buddhism. So, I wonder why that is. Uh, is it is it possible that the tools of Buddhism were not capable of taking people to the ex they stopped at a certain point and were not capable of taking people to the experience of God, or is there some other reason for this discrepancy? Well, as Buddha said, I'll just get it started and then I'd be interested. As the Buddha said on the whole issue of God, as a whole whole bunch of other things, I think he would put that in what he called the, the list of imponderables. Mm -hmm. Which is basically, as he, he defined what his spirituality was for him, which was, you know, about suffering and the alleviation of suffering. Mm -hmm. And he saw there's a whole lot of things, a whole lot of metaphysical speculating that, according to him, was, he says, this is what we're about. All this, all this metaphysical speculation isn't going to serve this end. So mm -hmm. basically, I'm not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I won't, even, I won't even entertain it because it doesn't have anything to do with the, with the, with the ending of suffering. So that's, I think, one of, you know, his, one of the reasons that he didn't, he didn't get into sort of the God question or any number of questions that are more metaphysical in nature. Hmm. But there have been many saints and traditions which talk of God consciousness and which uh, people who say, that God has become a living, a living experience. So one yeah. man's metaphysics may be another man's actual experience. And right. so that's why I kind of was wondering whether Buddhism or even the Buddha's own experience might have only gone so far and that um, a richer, more nuanced, perhaps more highly evolved, if I can be so blasphemous, uh, level of development would render God a living reality rather than just a metaphysical concept or belief. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in the Christian mystical tradition, there are two uh, contrasting kind of approaches that are often talked about, and the terms that are used are that the cataphatic, which means the way of light, the way of affirmation, the way of definition, almost you could say, and the apophatic, which is the way of darkness, the way of unknowing, the way of sort of, uh, um, yeah, darkness, you know. And both of those paths, again, we keep coming back to this, that there are kind of complementary things that both work together. Mm -hmm. And in the life of a human being, the spiritual journey of any of us, there are times in our life when our, the revelation that's given to us, the clarity that comes to us, is absolutely clear. It's absolutely kind of affirming. We can state very definitely, I know this to be true, you know, I see this, it seems true, it feels true, mm -hmm. it, it, it's true when I put it into practice, it works for me and so on. That's the way of light. And then there are other times, there are other, you know, seasons in our journey, our spiritual journey, which are darkness, which mm -hmm. is the path of darkness, the path of unknowing, where we know through unknowing. You know, and that's, that's a theme that arises again and again in the Christian contemplative tradition is this, this path of unknowing that God, what we call God, that mystery that some of us call God, is absolutely beyond any concept. It's absolutely beyond any definition. And, and, and like in the, in, the, in the 14th century classic, The Cloud of Unknowing, he says, all we can do is sit before this reality and, and, and with, a, with a blind stirring of love. You know, we can come to it, we can contemplate it, but we can't grasp it. You know, we can't define it. We can't get a hold of it and say, here it is, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think there are times in our life when we do need clarity, we do need like kind of definite sort of affirming principles or statements about the spiritual reality we've seen. And then there are other times when that just doesn't do the trick, you know. And we have to admit, okay, you know, this is in the realm of unknowing. This is, this is beyond the conceptual sort of intellectual um, doctrinal kind of level. Does that make sense? So yeah. I think you kind of need both 
again, it's, 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 it keeps recurring tonight, mm -hmm. but it's not like one is true and one is false. Like in Buddhism, okay, he's not affirming uh, the word God, and he's not talking about God, but he talks about nibbana. He talks about the deathless nirvana. Mm -hmm. He talks about the cessation of suffering. So in Christianity, they might say, oh, the reality you're looking for is this God, this spiritual reality, whereas the Buddha says, no, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the, the end of suffering. Mm -hmm. So he, he's defining it, but in a negative way, mm -hmm. you see, rather than in a positive way. I'm not so sure that the, that the truth they're pointing to is absolutely mutually exclusive, nor am I sure it's absolutely the same thing. Right. But I think there's depends, probably... But who, it may be stages. Who we're talking about, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's clearly some very, you know, quite advanced Christian mystics that basically oh, are, yeah. are still in a relational relationship with God. Then there's Christian mystics who also themselves have gone right beyond any relation. To union. Mm -hmm. What's that? To union with God. Yeah, beyond union. Yeah. I mean, Meister Eckhart, Eckhart makes that very, very clear. This is, this, yeah. is not, this is not union. This is, this is beyond union. This is beyond God. He went so far as to say, of God, I am the cause. Yeah. Right? As a way of, 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 I think, trying to be as clear as he can, could and, you know, no... Uh, um, I mean, that's a statement that would get most people in your church today b to blush quite hard, you know, if someone uh -huh. said that. It, it got people killed. And, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I, well, he had the good sense to die before they could kill him yeah. for it. You know <laughs> what I mean? He was, so, he was posthumously excommunicated. Right, I mean, he was excommunicated and then kind of re-embraced. He so, was, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. so, um, yeah. You know. That was, um, We'll take questions pretty soon. I, I, I know a lot of you probably have questions. Um, I was uh, riding down with a friend, and we were talking in the car, and he, he has a lot, of, a lot of study of Christianity and degrees and doctorates and all that stuff. But <laughs> um, And he said, you know, what evidence do we have that Jesus was actually self-realized? The terminology is not used in the Bible. So can we actually, can we safely assume that he was self-realized in the way that we're describing here or the, the way the Buddha might have described, although he didn't use that term. Or could he have been, you know, some other type of being altogether who wasn't enlightened in the conventional sense? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Or is that too speculative to even con consider? I th I may, we could say, I think, if we're going to, you know, speculate we have the first thing we have to admit is we actually know very little very little about either one of these two right. two people you know um i mean buddhism has as much mythology around the buddha's life as christianity does around mm. jesus's life um i think at the end of the day at least for me the end of the day is number one how how far am i going to speculate on it with something that i literally can never know yeah if I can't know, what am I wasting my time with? Mm -hmm. Do you know? And at the, even more than that, I think at the end of the day, to to us, you know, what's important is is this is this teaching useful? Yeah. In what way is this really useful for me? Because I can't actually know. You know, I can't sit down and talk to the historical Jesus or the historical Buddha and you know and try to rank them on the hierarchy of you know realization um i'm not even so sure it's that relevant yeah it kind of seems like a dumb question in retrospect um well, could no, say, I'm not saying could, no offense to my friend no. <laughs> you could I, say that you could say I, the same thing about anybody today that's question. living today yeah any teacher anybody you know mm -hmm. me or audio or ramana or anybody right. or anybody living or dead you could say well how do we know that this person is realized? How do we know that this person is enlightened or whatever? But Jesus himself had a kind of, at least a, in a saying that's attributed to Jesus, uh, mm -hmm. since we're going this historical critical kind of route, um, that where he says, by their fruits you will know them. Yes. And my sense is that anything we do, any teaching we follow, any practice we do, any teacher we listen to, we can judge the value of it based on what fruit does it bear. Does it help me to become more loving, more compassionate, more wise, more understanding, or not? And that's a pretty simple breakdown, you know? 
And he also said things that really seemed to point to his object, subjective realization, experience mm -hmm. of realization, such as, I and my father are one, and mm -hmm. whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me, mm -hmm. and things like that kind of unitive experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the whole issue of miracles? I mean, miracles play big in the Bible. There's all, all kinds of stuff, and, and I, I don't know a whole lot about Buddhism again, but uh, as I understand it, all kinds of amazing things were attributed to the Buddha as mm -hmm. well. Do you think this is just sort of... Um, embellishment that took place over time or do you think that these beings were at a level in which they were actually capable of doing such things and were doing it uh, I don't know to impress to 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 convince people that they they, they had something extraordinary and um, or what what would you what would we care to say about that topic um. <laughs> You know, often in the, in the gospel accounts of Jesus doing miracles, he would heal somebody or other of something, and, and then he would say, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Just keep this to yourself. You know, uh, keep it kind of, uh, what's that, on the down low. <laughs> you know, let's not, yeah, let's not, let's not, you know, advertise this. And my own sense is that, um, and this is also based on my own experience, frankly, that, that whenever anybody comes into a sense of realization, a sense of clarity about life, it opens us up to different dimensions. It opens us up to uh, a kind of whole new reality, which I think often does include what many people would term miracles. Um, you know, on the other hand, like that attitude Jesus had, I can I get that you know I understand mm -hmm. it because my own sense is just like what what the Buddha said about uh, what's really necessary what's really helpful you know I, I look at miracles in cities and things like that you know they are real I mean I I, I I think there's no doubt about it they are definitely real they happen in the lives of realized beings are they really that important I would say no I don't think they're that important I think they're almost like side effects of awakening rather than the main thing. And uh, the Buddha has a beautiful passage in, in one of the Pali uh, scriptures where he says, see this huge forest with all these leaves, you know. He was at some big deer park forest where he had a, he had a vihara a dwelling amongst. He said, see this big forest, O oh, oh monks. You know, he's always addressing the monks. Mm -hmm. um, all the leaves on all these trees are all leaves. They're all alive. They're all valid as leaves. But see the leaves in the palm of my hand? He said, this is like the teachings and the truths that exist in the world. They're as countless as the leaves on the trees. But what you need to awaken is equal to the number of leaves in the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. So you don't need all that stuff to awaken. And the most important thing is wake up. Yeah. And most, most, I know the Christian tradition puts an emphasis, the Buddhist tradition puts a heavy emphasis, most esoteric traditions put an emphasis when it comes to sort of the spiritual powers or cities or clairvoyance, lots of things that can come as part of the package. They all have, a, have had this very traditional attitude, mm -hmm. which is basically, don't pay any attention. Like, okay, if it shows up, it shows up fine. <clears throat> But, you know, don't get, don't get involved. We're not trying to create magicians here. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's something. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a reason for that is because when those sort of powers start to come on, online, if we grasp at them and it starts to become about that, we actually stunt our development. Mm -hmm. We will stop right there. We may stop in a pretty extraordinary place, but that'll be it. And I think that's the reason why, sure, these things can happen, but the council across world religions has been, you know. Don't make a yeah. big deal about Don't it. Don't make a big deal, a, a really and big deal about Jesus it. Jesus said, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, right? And then all else shall be added unto thee. Mm -hmm. um, my teacher used to use this analogy of capture the fort. There's this big territory. It has all kinds of diamond mines and gold mines and things like that. You might want to go out and start exploring those and mining for gold. But if you don't own the territory, you're on shaky ground. So capture the fort and mm -hmm. then see what's what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I, what I liked, what drew me to Zen when I first got into it. Because it was, in its traditional sense, it's the hot and narrow pursuit of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. 
Yeah. Yeah. When, and very little consolation prizes along the way. <laughs> you know, which, <laughs> Except getting hit by a stick. Except getting hit by sticks, if that's what does it for you, you know? Hey, worked for me, but, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so, um, because, yeah, because when we're going into, when we're doing any sort of contemplative practice, what we're, what we're engaging in is the vast potentiality of human consciousness, which is extraordinary. Um, and so because it's extraordinary, you know, it's, it, it, is rel it can be kind of easy to get kind of like oh, sidetracked side into this little cul-de-sac of potentiality. And it's not that any of those are inherently sort of wrong. It's just that, you know, if you want... If you really want the the ultimate truth, then that's that's where the counsel comes. Don't don't waste too much time in the cold sex. Mm. Yeah. There's a beautiful story in the Gospels uh, that's called the the story of the Transfiguration, where Jesus is with uh, the disciples and he's on this mountain, and suddenly Moses and Elijah appear in a vision of light, and Jesus is communing with Moses and Elijah, and they're all their garments are as white as snow and they're, they're shining like the sun, and the disciples are like beholding this amazing sight. And Peter, who was this brash guy that was always making funny kind of suggestions, <laughs> and a lot like maybe a lot of us, or at least like me, and he says to Jesus, Oh Lord, it's good that we are here. Let us build tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, and we'll just stay here the rest of our lives, you know? And Jesus says, You know, no, Peter, that's not the idea. We got to go down the mountain, back into the valley, mm -hmm. and face life, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, often what happens with those kind of things is that we can become so enamored of, of the, the, the kind of fascinating quality of powers and healing and visions and so on that we can just really get sidetracked and just be in a, you know, like you say, a cul-de-sac mm -hmm. and not move forward at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus and Buddha were obviously both men, and uh, Buddha set up monasteries full of men, and Christ's 12 apostles were men. Um, of course, there was you know, Mary Magdalene and, and Jesus' mother and so on and so forth, and to this day, the, the Catholic Church doesn't allow women to be priests. Um, I think it would be interesting to touch upon the whole issue of the divine feminine and uh, mm -hmm. the, the importance of um, perhaps um, greater balance between the feminine and, and the masculine in the world and perhaps the, the, the necessity of a, 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 uh, something that's more than these old traditions had to offer if, if they're really so male-dominated dom as they mm -hmm. seem. Any comments about all that? Sure, I'll take a shot at it. And then you're <laughs> welcome to fill in. I mean, bo both of these people for their for their time in their culture in their culture they were pretty pretty free thinking when it came to mm -hmm. when it came to to men and women mm -hmm. you know they both had women you know i mean buddha certainly um, um you know it, i think I've, i often thought like what was the appeal for god's sake you know to go around and say nirvana which basically means sensation okay that's your big payoff and no self is your doctrine. And I, I used to think, now, now how did this catch on? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but historic, historically, a big part of the reason that it ca caught on is because he was one of the very few people that, um, that, that, that spoke out against the caste system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's basically, you know, you, you, you can become what you make of your life. You don't need to be defined by the role you've been or your gender or anything else. Um, and, you know, for its day, that was quite extraordinary. Um, you know, G Jesus had some quite extraordinary relationships with women mm -hmm. in, in the Bible. Um, you know, I, one of my favorite parts of the whole Jesus story is, um, when Mary Magdalene comes in at that dinner table and she's, you know, she's weeping at Jesus' feet and, and just basically kind of falling apart and gets chastised by the main guy that was there. You know, how dare you do this? And boy, did Jesus have some harsh words for him. Mm -hmm. You know, she just, he immediately stopped the whole, the whole proceeding 
and had some a very harsh rebuke. So in that sense, I think they both they both um, were were certainly far advanced of the day how they related it. But one other little bit different entry point for me is when I said you know my Christianity sort of helped me a very significant part, and it really was the feminine aspect. Because Zen, in its traditional sense, is in its very masculine sort of religious setup. And there's a beautiful, there's a beauty with, to go with that starkness and all the rest. My mother used to call it Buddha boot camp. Every time I go off to retreat, she'd say, you're going off to Buddha boot camp, because it, it very much is very much like a boot camp almost. Mm -hmm. Curiously enough, the thing that really, that was initially the most transformative part of reaching into Christianity was when I found um, that little uh, diary from St. Teresa of Lisieux. And, and she was, you know, this, 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 this saint, this woman saint who died very young, I think in her 20s. 23. 23. And she was, you know, uh, over the top, sort of pious. And, and she just had a huge love of Jesus. And, you know, all these things that, you know, when I looked back, sometimes I thought, well, what did I see there? Um, because it's so, so almost of a different time. And a, but something about when I was at the age that I encountered that diary that she had written shortly before she died, and there was something about that, and it was a woman, I think, which was a really important part, too, mm. and the way that she talked about this and how relational and warm it was and almost childlike in her in the simplicity with which she approached her relationship with Christ. And it, it really just, reading this thing, I, I found myself captured, and I literally felt, I was like about 23 or 24 years old, and I felt like I was like 15 years old um, in my first romantic love affair. And it's with this dead saint. <laughs> You know, from a, from, a, from a tradition that wasn't my own. But she was cute, though. Yeah, she was kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, she, she was pretty hot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there was something about that, about it was a real, it was, it, it was something, a very feminine approach. And it literally just lit my heart on fire. So that's, and the effect of it was, was literally going around like when you feel it's your first love affair, you know, you just walk around in this intense, emotional, open environment of, of, of love and intimacy, and that's the effect it had on me. And that was a really feminine, you know, very yeah. much a, a feminine, feminine effect for me. It was, mm -hmm. it was very, very, very um, uh, important, and so I had this intimate relationship with a dead saint for about a year it, it burned very very hot huh. and then when the heart was really open it's like that moved on and then I could then then that openness was mine and then I could start to see it oh the bodhisattva compassion okay now I can start to relate before I couldn't I think I needed a very strong feminine <clears throat> view of all this mm. that woke up something um, that uh, just wasn't happening any other way. So I think... Incidentally, that, when uh, Francis and I first proposed that I moderate this, this discussion, the organizer said, do we really want three middle-aged, middle-class white guys on stage? Uh, <laughs> Point <laughs> we, well taken. We, we should have a woman be the moderator. And I, and I said, yes, I agree, but I would like to bring this discussion to tens of thousands of people, not just to a couple hundred. And so for that reason, I'd really like to moderate it and get it on my show. And we went back and forth for a while, but it was, it was a point well taken. And I yeah. think and at the SAN conference, this has been an issue too, you know, there seems to be, and in kind of contemporary non-dual spirituality, there just seems to be this little bit of a predominance of male teachers. And what we try to do with Bat Gap is, <clears throat> um, really make it 50-50 now. Okay, we mm -hmm. had a man, let's have a woman. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, keep, ba keep it balanced because mm -hmm. they're, you know, some of the most enlightened people I know happen to be women and I really don't, I think we should do what we can to dispel the stereotype if there is one 
that it's a, a male-oriented kind of thing. Yeah, and women, I mean, somebody who, I, mean, I can't do all the little math in my head right now, but I, I think I've asked to teach more women than men. I, um, it's, at the very least, it would be equal, and I think there's still more women yeah. that, I, that I've asked to teach. And I mean, there's not a particular reason for that, but there is an observation that, that I definitely have seen mm -hmm. that... Um, that women bring something different to the table. They just, they bring something different to the table that's very, really, really, really important and I think really, really necessary. And I think that that's one of the things that's heartening about current time. Yes, we need more really, really talented um, women spiritual teachers out there, but it's, it's growing, I think, quite, rapidly and I think it's very very important just because they there's there is that there's not not that all women have the same perspective any more than all women, men have the same perspective but there's something that's definitely different mm -hmm. that they they tend to bring to the table and embody let's open it up for questions um, somebody has a mic and Ben has a mic I'm so glad I have both of you in a room together to ask a question um, in my experience, I started my spiritual journey in Christianity. Grew up in a household, went to a mission trip, was a very good church kid for a long time. And one of the main things that drove me out of that into a more open, integrated spirituality that I seek now is guilt. And since I, I have Aja here and I have you, Francis, I just want to know your perspective on guilt in Christianity because it has a big name uh, for that religion, and then your perspective, Aja, as well, on the role that it plays in our life and our spiritual journey. That guilt plays? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, my own sense, to be honest with you, is that um, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence, you know? It's an old adage, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. And... Uh, when I was a Buddhist monk for a couple of years, I actually traveled a little bit in Southeast Asia. And we seem to think, we in the West, you know, we've been raised with Judeo-Christian ethics and sensibilities, and many of us have gone to churches or synagogues or whatever, and um, we very much rejected that in some ways, and a lot of people are turning to the East and rejecting the West and, and, and having a kind of perception that, that guilt was a big part of their heritage in that, and perhaps it was, and that's something that, uh, you know, I would never deny if that was a person's experience. Uh, that wasn't my experience, frankly, but, but it was many people's experience. But the thing is, I, I think Christianity has no corner on the market of guilt. I mean, all the religions are pretty, have that pretty well covered, uh, including Buddhism, <laughs> including Hinduism, and you know all of them. I mean, and I think a lot of times in the West we romanticize the East and we think, oh, they've got it all figured out and they're all walking around enlightened. But go to the East, <laughs> you know. I would invite you. I I, I went to Buddhist countries, and um, I found all the kind of things that all the kind of aberrations that we find in Christian churches of of guilt and. And, 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 and weird ideas about sexuality and all that. They're all alive and well in Southeast Asian Buddhist <laughs> culture, you know. So, um, but I think it is true that we do need to get to a point in our lives where we can really look at the spiritual heritage we've been given, the things we've been taught, and really say, you know, this is helpful, this is not so helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, this I can embrace, this I think I need to let go of. And be honest about it and, and, and just let go of it and move on. Does that make some sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, me, me and Francis have talked about this be, before. Is we, we, we both did admittedly get kind of lucky in our religious formation. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you didn't end up with a big guilt complex growing up Catholic, like, you know, some, some do. And, well, I didn't grow up with a whole heck of a lot of organized religion anyway until I started my own sort of quest. However, I grew up in a family, although I absolutely love my, my root family and, and feel extremely also lucky to be part of it, but also part of what the underlying dynamics in the family were was guilt. 
not in the same sense that you might think about it, you know, if you come from the traditional idea of sort of the Catholic guilty person or something, but just sort of this undercurrent that, no, that wasn't spoken, but even very young, I could see like, oh, I can see how guilt is actually has everybody, you know, even at a subtle level, and, it's, and, it's, and I could see it from a very young age how it played itself out, and uh, at a certain point in my early teens, I don't know how I did this, I'm, even my mother has asked me, because she, she's like, how did you escape the guilt thing? How did you do it? And I go, I don't know, but at about 13, I just looked and I thought, that doesn't work very well. <laughs> That's just a lot of energy churning away at feeling, you know, bad. And somehow, I don't know why, that was enough for me. It just disconnected me from unhealthy guilt. You know, I do think that there is, however, there is that we do have, which is a very good thing, and it's its own journey to find a conscience that is not culturally manufactured, you mm -hmm. know, because you can have a conscience that actually belongs to your culture rather than to you. But I think we also do have a kind of conscience. It's, it's our sort of that, that, that um, North Pole thing inside of ourselves that the more quiet we get and the more listening we are, it's one of the things we have to we have to account for, because that will hold us to its own, the standard of our own integrity and our own honesty. And I think that, that version of it can feel good and empowering because we, we want to have that resource of truth and integrity, and we want to have something inside of us letting us know when we start to lose our way. You know, we really need that but what we really don't need is this big cultural bag, baggage of, of guilt that some people, you know, quite a few folks, I think it's one of the things that also is heavy in this culture. Um, mm. Not having traveled all around the East, I'm not so sure, but you know, we, what, and, the, and it's not just a Christian thing. I mean, you know, I've done this for 20 years and I find guilt runs rampant everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian, you have it in a Christian context. Mm -hmm. If you're an atheist, then you just you feel guilty in an atheist context. You know, it's <laughs> it's nobody has a. Um, but I think it's if anybody feels that, I think sometimes it is good <coughs> before you even try to get rid of it to s almost like step back in into yourself and just see like okay. How does this really work for me? Is this, mm -hmm. Does this really work? Or what part of this does work and tied in with my own innate sense of truthfulness and integrity and what part of this really doesn't work? You know, it just disempowers me and it makes me always <coughs> doubt myself. And, you know, um, curiously enough, I read many, many years ago where somewhere where Ramana said, the last thing to go uh, is doubt. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people get guilt going around doubts. They, 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 the two kind of things can really swirl together. And I thought it was really interesting that he'd said the last thing to go is a kind of, you know, doubt. Because, and I think it has to do with this, this finding our real autonomy. You know, as I, I like to think, I think a spirit, one of the most important jobs of a spiritual teacher is to immediately begin establishing with anybody who's with them, helping them to see what they can trust in themselves mm -hmm. and what's not so trustworthy in themselves because you're basically then you're empowering somebody and then the teacher isn't basically just used as the sole reference for what's true or real or useful, but the teacher's actually helping you find that out within yourself. And I think it's one of the very first things that really should be happening. And however, I often find that it's the last thing that does happen. If at all. It, if at all, right. Because it, it can be very alluring for the teacher to just remain as the sole repository of truth. You know, it's a very alluring uh, illusion.
to I've actually uh, noticed that sometimes when people leave a spiritual organization that they've been in for years or decades, they they have an awakening shortly thereafter. <laughs> it's it's sort of they're able to drop a lot of baggage or something yeah. or reassess their deeply ingrained assumptions that they had taken for granted for so so many years. Yeah. And just that little bit of liberation on that level yeah. kind of triggers a, a, a deeper realization um, mm -hmm. in consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting yeah. uh, perspective, yeah. Want to say anything, Francis, or should we take another question? Let's take another, another question. question. Thanks. Hi, I'm scared. <laughs> um, when you first started uh, talking, um, I'm trying to, um, let me turn the page there. We were talking about suffering and some suffering being optional mm -hmm. and uh, that the richness of life also em and embracing a richness of life also involves actually feeling suffering of a different nature than optional suffering mm -hmm. and that was my understanding of what you said and that 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 it gives a broad range of experience uh, and tied in with there not being you know black and white but an embracing of every color um, that you spoke of early on mm -hmm. and it, this the topic went into an acceptance uh, and being in acceptance of, of, you know, what is coming, you know, what is. And on a personal note, I am struggling with a disease that, that I'm having to uh, both witness and not want to be in acceptance with that my outcome is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm fighting but also trying to hold that the acceptance uh, of that this is, uh, is there too. And I, I have a, um, I'm trying to find that path of being in acceptance and fighting uh, it at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Is that clear, the question? It is to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, Can you help me on that? Mm. Well, number one, I, I, I can sympathize with you because I, I guess what I, I have my own sort of disease, I guess they would say, that causes pain, as people know. Um, and so I'm pretty much in pain most all the time to some degree. It just varies during the day from from a little bit to catastrophic <laughs> that's the, that's the spare and it's it's a it's a it's a it's a very good and ruthless teacher and talk about starting to inquiring about what is optional and not optional suffering do you know um, is what it's what it has really you know shown is the absolute necessity of not going into time and that may sound abstract, but why that I mean, whenever we're dealing with difficulty, one of the things that can make it so difficult is we're in time like, oh God, can I survive this tomorrow? And will I have this forever? And will I, you know? And so we, we, we take pain and then through our mind, which is usually fear, fear of our pain and how long it might last, um, then we go into this sort of secondary narrative. That's, that's optional, that's the good news. Like that whole movement of suffering is optional. It may take some real awareness and some real practice to work with that narrative stream that goes, which I think always begins with realizing where it comes from. So many of our painful narrative ways we talk to ourselves are coming out of fear. Like I said, how long will this last? Will I ever get over this? So to me, acceptance is also not something I think of in terms of time. Like I'll accept and that means it'll be this way forever. It just means no, right now, in this moment, what feels better? To fight what I'm experiencing 
or to accept it? Just right now. And if I accept it, does that mean I can't there still try to treat it or help myself? No. You can still treat, treat and, and do everything you can for your body or whatever it might be. You can still do all of that with, while at each moment having that almost become a, a, its own kind of practice. That each moment I can either accept this moment and what it entails as it is and I can see how that, what that feels like to do that. Or I can go into my fearful thoughts about da 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 you know? And then you really start to see. And it take, it's, when you have something physical that you're dealing with, it takes the abstraction out of it. Mm. You, know, you, you see very, very quickly if you're starting to go into a spin around your physical <laughs> discomfort or if your, the discomfort is accepted. Like, yes, okay, this is it. Mm -hmm. So, um, th that's, that's what I've seen. And, and it sounds, I may be making it sound overly simplistic, but I think this is actually the level at which it can be worked with and worked with very, very, very effectively. You know, that to really make that discrimination between pain and the suffering that my mind is imposing upon me because it's spinning, you know, and scaring itself. Can I, can I reflect back of what course. I think you said? Yeah. Uh, or how I heard it. <laughs> um, was that to, to be in the moment and to hold a center mm -hmm. while watching the abstraction of the mind uh, traveling towards fear mm -hmm. and still maintaining a course of treatment for what the ailment may be. Yeah. But don't, <laughs> don't spice it with the mind's <laughs> abstractions. Too. Basically, that's the, that's the key. Got it. You know, because our, our, like, our minds like security, right? They like knowing what's going to come as long as what we think is going to come is good. So that's the way they're hooked up. Their, their security, survival, all those kind of instincts are part of the structure of, of the mind. And however, even though that is the structure of the mind, that the mind can actually be shown that there's a whole different way to relate with challenge with difficulty, with discomfort. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I always think take this, all this as, um, as a question rather than something you're trying to impose upon yourself. So in other words, you could go, okay, I heard I just say I'm gonna try to be in the moment <laughs> with what's happening, and you're trying to be, and it hurts, and you're like, and you know, you're trying to impose this idea, and it's like, oh crap, I've heard it a million times, and it's not working, and you know, all that kind of stuff can easily happen. Rather than even approaching it that way, flip it over and approach it like a question. I wonder what would happen right now. I wonder. Let me find out if I could accept my discomfort, let's say physical discomfort, just right now, just for a moment, 30 seconds. I can change if I want to, but can't, what, would, what would it be like if I was to just accept this moment? Can I accept this moment the way it is? You see, so it's a question. Then you're involved you're right there. The question is actually leading you in rather than an idea you're trying to impose upon yourself called be in the moment, right? Instead, you're like, let me see what it's like to be in the moment for me right now, you know? And I just find it it's, it's makes it much easier to deal, to approach all this stuff when you approach it with a little bit of curiosity and, you know, and... Um, my own Please. sense, too, is that um, in my life and in my teaching, I think surrender is, for me, the primary practice. I really think it is. I think meditation, in a way, is a preparation for 
surrender. <laughs> because meditations, I often call it surrender on a cushion. Uh, it's learning to just be with what is yeah. in a very controlled environment. But surrender takes that out into the world. And, and actually in situations where we've been told, okay, I have a disease I have to deal with. I have this situation that I don't particularly like or find pleasant, you know. And I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the practice of surrender. I think many times we feel, uh, again, it's the mind's tendency to be this either or kind of thing. Either you're absolutely, completely resigned to what happens in some very extremely passive way, or you're fighting for all your worth and you're opposing what is in some really aggressive sense. And I think the reality of it is more, as the Buddha would say, it's a middle path between those two extremes. It's where we say, okay, we start with a ground of absolute acceptance. We start with this ground of surrender. And the wonderful thing about it is that we don't have to work ourselves up into surrender. We don't have to somehow manufacture it. Uh, when, I, when I do a guided meditation on surrender that I often do with people, uh, the words that I ask people to repeat as a way of accessing something along these lines is, there's a place in my heart that allows this. Mm -hmm. There's a place in my heart that accepts this. You know, and if we go deep enough, there's a place in my heart that even loves this, simply mm -hmm. because it is, not because of any quality it holds or anything. And if we can turn within and find that place in our heart, we can bring that to our engagement with life. And that doesn't mean at all that we're passive. That doesn't mean that we don't treat the illness. It doesn't mean we don't respond. In fact, we respond from this ground of absolute unconditional openness and acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then the response is extremely skillful. Because it's, not, it's no longer motivated by this sort of desperate thing. This should not be, you know. There's this ground that, yes, this is not pleasant. I don't like it, but it is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, maybe I should do this. Mm -hmm. You know, again, just like experiment. Yeah. What would it be like if I did that, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think it's not this sort of either-or thing. Either we're completely surrendered and utterly passive and we just lay down and let life roll over us like a, a steamroller, or we're aggressively fighting life at every turn. It's kind of finding that razor's edge that we can walk. Where there's this ground of surrender, and then there's action that arises out of that ground and it's particularly skillful. But it may be very active, it may be very decisive, it may be very strong mm -hmm. action, you know? Does that make some sense or That was very, very clear, thank you. Very good. good. Thanks. Who has a question? Anyone? So I have a question, Rick. Oh, sorry. Hi, Craig. Hi. So I have a uh, question for Francis as my friend and Adi as my teacher. Uh, <laughs> through a number of years, um, you know, as a child, I always had this deep uh, connection with Jesus. Mm -hmm. you know, even as I walked in here this evening, I feel this descent of grace, you know, this huge love in my heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, through meeting you, Adya, I was able to keep that connection mm -hmm. all the way up through the unitive state. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I found when you guided me beyond the unitive state that this deep connection with grace began to fall away. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's something I haven't quite reconciled yet. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so in my experience, I, t I tend to go back and forth between feeling, you know, in a sense, this great uh, nothingness and great experience of, say, been a, being in a place of non-reflection, mm -hmm. where everything is here is this, and there's no more. And that will happen, say, for a season or a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be this other thing that comes forward in a different season of, again, this descent of grace mm -hmm. and this open-hearted love you know, throughout my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting too is because I can have a whole season of this experience of no self 
But when I go forward and teach and meet with another, this grace pours through me and there's this transmission. And there's almost just like this great sense of joy and happiness in my heart. Oh, oh yes, I'm so happy to have this again. And then, you know, I wake up the next morning and, you know, there's this experience of, you know, almost like nothingness. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you, and, you know, to you, Francis, and you, Adi, as my teacher, is at some point do these two reconcile? Mm -hmm. Did it fall into one or the other? Oh, I see. Or, yeah. you know, is it, is there also a possibility you know, because I think we have this assumption that no self, cessation, nirvana is, is actually the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. But is there something, you know, that perhaps is beyond that too, where yeah. the two come together? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's always something beyond. Yeah. I can no longer relate to ends of journeys, you know. I've, I've got yeah. to the end of the infinite. I'm not even sure what that would possibly mean. But you, I think there's something that you spoke of that's it's very, that caught my attention. Um, because we are like every other as human beings, right? We are, we are also just like any other part of nature. And we all, we all have our seasons. And I don't mean just in the big sense we usually think that. Um, but I've certainly noticed, um, have noticed and continue to notice that there are, that there's just so, sort of these seasons internally that, that I'll, I'll go through. They're almost predictable now that I've you know, gotten to know that season. It's cert certain, I almost think of like certain elements of reality are highlighting highlighted. Sometimes it's emptiness and no self part of you part. And then other times like this a much a, a richer, more intimate, you know, closeness, you know, thing will 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 start to be highlighted. And so at least to begin with the response is I think this 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 undulating seasons that we have is very natural. You know, it's it's a very natural thing. Um, I think that the, uh, the more we mature, they, there are certain elements that kind of do come to get, start to come together. Um, but there are also certain things that we, that we, that there are certain, I think, things that are pleasant, that some, some, some really pleasant things we outgrow. Like when I was talking about how I felt when I discovered St. Teresa, you know, and that how important and absolutely vital that was for me. And yet I couldn't get that, that to the, that experience now if someone put a gun to my head. There's no, I have, there's no, I would have no, no way to recreate it because it was, it was way, way too um, relational in a certain sense. Not that I'm not relational, but it was, it's just, it was just a different a different quality, as beautiful as it was, um, it's, it, it's not like that love has disappeared, it's just continued to grow and, and change, and it's like, it will never throw, in the same way that, you know, we won't throw, it back, throw our life in re reverse and go back to, you know, well, I never had a high school love affair, but you know what I'm talking about. That's, you know, the, that's the, the point is, isn't to continue to go back to those really, really pleasant places. But there is, there is points of, of our own real, realization where um, in the same way that seeing the world with some of the old eyes we might have seen it with at a certain point is just no longer optional. It just doesn't work for us. We almost can't get back to seeing life in a way we might have seen it before. I think even in the realms of spiritual experience, that um, that there are experiences that that we either leave behind, or they mature so much that they look very very different, almost unrecognizable toward how they began. Um, you know, and so I don't. Of course, if yeah, it was but, only say, emptiness and you never had any intimacy of the heart, then that would be lopsided. Yeah, and, and right. beyond, say, it just being a pleasant experience, 
But what I'm sp speaking about more so is the direct experience of divinity yeah. flooding into you as you. It's not always, you yeah. know, some pleasant, blissful, you know, love affair like you were speaking about, but yeah. just a very deep and profound mm -hmm. personal relationship, mm -hmm. you know, with the divine. Because, you know, what I'm experiencing is, is yes, absolutely, a personal God. And yes, absolutely, a completely non-personal, non-relationship mm -hmm. with God. Almost like you were saying that mm -hmm. God disappears. Mm -hmm. And there's been times when, you know, I could almost, you know, curse the fact that I met you and say, <laughs> excuse my language, but, you know, what the fuck Not happened to my relationship? Mm -hmm with God to be where it, it disappeared so deeply. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, like I was speaking, you know, sometimes I'll go to teach or I'll meet with someone and then this thing comes through. Yes. And then that heart lights up again and there's a sense of, oh yes. And so, yeah. you know, the question is, you know, in your direct experience, you know, if you come to a place where it completely falls away, and is it appropriate to think of either or, this or that, or more just open and see what happens? I would always because that's, choose yeah. the open and see what happens. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, if I was to tell you totally, completely honest, honestly, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm in no way capable of having personal relationship with a God. It's gone. It hasn't been here for a long, 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 long time. And something better took its place. I'm not, you know, it's not like, it's not like I feel that, that that's a, you know, that that's really necessarily a, a, a loss, you know. That's, that's as honest I could be about it, you know. I feel like well, I have and both. See, and see, uh, uh, pardon me, Francis, but, and see, that's what's deeply interesting to me is oftentimes, you know, say with, if I follow this path to the end, it seems to take one there. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be the assumption that that is the final resting mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also curious, you know, if nirvana, if cessation is the final resting place, or if that continues to deepen in a way, you know, like you're describing that, I think it becomes it, does. it comes deeply yeah. more profound and yeah. inclusive instead of either or. Yeah, I mean, and so there being a lo being a loss there. Yeah. yeah, for me, what what replaced the sort of that sort of relational aspect of with God, let's say, not that I I don't have a problem having a relational aspect with you right now or with my wife, or I don't mean to imply that, um, but. Um, I think I do think that it's much healthier just to if we just forget about ultimate endpoints. It's one of the biggest stumbling blocks in all of spirituality. You know that the the infinite is going to be indicated by some definitive sort of endpoint, which I don't think it is. But so our my experiences, however, is that the the relational sort of emotion, let's say like um, love or even. Uh, um, the experience now is just that that, that of uh, I, the, my favorite way of putting it. It goes back to a long ways to a guy named Dogen, the famous Zen teacher, who talked about it as an absolute intimacy with the ten thousand things. And to me, there's a there's almost like a there's an intimacy that's 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 how can you, how do you even talk about a a, a, a feeling of tremendous intim intimacy, which is a grace. It's the experience of a kind of grace, isn't it? That, that's not relational in, in that way, you know, but nonetheless is very profound, very intimate, very close, no distance, not hanging out in just inner states of emptiness. It's not, you know, not any of that. I, I do think everything comes together at a, at a little higher level, although we do definitely go through periods, I think, of, of 
you know, losing sometimes those pers that, that more personal kind of experience, even with the divine, do you know? And again, not that it, we're making it as a goal to do that. I'm just, I've just seen this trajectory over so many people I can't even count them anymore. You know, that, that, and at any point, yes, you could stop in sort of the emptiness of no self and put down a camp and go, well, that's it. It mm -hmm. sounds like the text, you know what I mean? But I think if, we're, if we don't use all the outside references to tell us, to tell us everything, we, we have this intuitive sense, do we not, of when there seems to be just an inherent something that doesn't feel complete or, you know, there's, there's another, there's a door that could just maybe open, open up somewhere inside. I think we can feel these things and we can sense, we can sense when there, when some other door is, is opening. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, I don't want to, you know, we're probably in for time. I don't know. <laughs> it's a big subject. It's a really, really, yeah, as but you the, That's see where my heart goes is to that place that, no, there isn't an end point. But it seems like sometimes colleagues or friends or fellow teachers try to press that, oh, no, self is the end point. And to me, when I hear that and in my direct experience, it just seems as if it's missing something or it's not fully inclusive. I would and I think also, I'm working against that bias of, yeah. oh yes, endpoint. And to me, yeah. there's always been this sense of ever evolving into God forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever. Yeah. <laughs> Contrary to what folks around me have been you know, saying or pushing. So, yeah. th so thank you for leaving it. Yeah, I think the ever evolving it. is much safer, much more real. Yeah. And, uh, and to... to and also, there's the always the whole other subject of um, a lot of what I hear when I hear folks talk or even teach about no self, a lot of it just does not ring true to me, to be totally honest. It just does not ring true. I'm not saying it's not all true, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, those intuitions that we, again, that we have, like, hmm, does that feel complete to me? Does that feel that it's holding a sort of integral place in me or does there seem to be some way of having sort of landed or claimed a sort of inner territory and that's it and you know I've arrived and you know all that kind of stuff which is antithetical I think to all this. And, and that's why it hurts so much is because within me there's always a sense that to claim an endpoint is to deny the evolutionary nature of God, yeah. to deny the, the movement of life. Mm -hmm. And it seems to, to hurt when my mind tries to go there and say, oh, do I have to land here or there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, evolution may not have an end point, but I believe this meeting will have one. <laughs> and we've just about reached it. Um, so I... I uh, it would be fun to sit here for another hour and take more questions, but I'm afraid we can't. I'm sure they have to close the church up and everything. So I want to thank you all for coming and thank our wonderful speakers for being here. Um, at the risk of, well, any short final comments or, or anything? <laughs> or shall we? Oh, Francis, you were going That's to just... chant something at the end, a Christian chant. That would be a nice way to end it. Okay. Yeah. Um, this chant we chanted every night before we went to bed in the monastery and um, <clears throat> it's a hymn to the Divine Mother which in our case was Mary but doesn't have to be Mary it could be any Divine Mother you like and uh, you can put that in and I'll just do it in Latin and uh, you can just feel the, the energy of it you don't have to necessarily know the words of it what, what it's saying but uh, I always thought like in the monastic life could be a kind of very masculine place sometimes, especially in the Trappists, which were very rigorous and independence and into suffering and into, you know, the hard ascetic kind of qualities. But uh, then at the end of the day, we'd sing this hymn to the Holy Mother, you know, and it had a kind of soft feminine mm -hmm. and uh, a feel to it. So we started out with a Buddhist chant. The whole thing was the embrace of Jesus and Buddha. So maybe we'll end with this. Christian chant uh, to the Divine Mother and
might be a nice way to end the end our evening. Mm -hmm. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Et Spes Nostra Salve. Ad te clamamus, exules filieve, ad te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, Advocata nostra, ilos tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte. Et Iesu, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis, Post hoc exilium ostende. O oh, clemens, O oh, pia, O oh, O oh, O oh, O oh, Virgo Maria.